On this episode of the Star Trek Universe podcast, we are talking about Star Trek Discovery, episode 308, The Sanctuary. And uh, we're getting into your feedback as well. Right after these messages from people we have absolutely no control over. Welcome to the Star Trek Universe Podcast, the podcast where you get to listen in on the continuing Star Trek conversation the two lifelong friends have been having since they were five years old. My name is Matthew Carroll. I'm David C. Robertson. What is happening, Dave? Oh, you know, man, from the streets, 205. Yep, yep that's I, true. I don't know. 205 life. That's what I've heard. Um, <laughs> That's what they tell me, the kids, <laughs> these days. <laughs> so, the, what, what, what are your, you know, I don't know, should we just go straight into the uh, freaking some summary here? I, I mean, sure, if that's what you want to do. Let's do it, man. Let's do it. Let's talk about Discovery. All right, man. The uh, the CBS All Access summary. Burnham and the USS Discovery crew travel to Book's home planet to help rescue it from Osira, the formidable leader of the Emerald Chain. Meanwhile, Stamets and Adira continue their search for valuable information on the origin of the burn. Who's Adira? I'm just joking. Um, <laughs> <laughs> still getting used to the new crew and people and yeah, even no, the ones that have been fine. here for three years. <laughs> yeah, there's a couple of them. I'm like... Who? <laughs> Wait, what? But no, I remember Reese now, and uh, um, I when I see her name on the screen, I go, "Oh yeah, I know who that goes to." <laughs> and uh, Detmer, I know Detmer. Yep, I know and, Detmer. Uh, I got Detmer yeah, down now. So, um, and then yeah, so and I don't know her name, but when I see the blonde girl, I go, "Oh, hey, there's that's the that's the robot lady." Yeah, and now I've forgotten the robot lady's name. We're such bad podcasters. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what do you want to do? I, I I I'm really bad about names. No, I think here's the thing with this show, and it's interesting because it, I think it's changed this season, which is why we're both starting to do a little more recognizing of more people. I think this mm-hmm. show for the first few seasons was like, it's, it was the Burnham show and all of the rest of the crew was sort of just ancillary. And, and the, depending on your proximity to Burnham was how much screen time you got. I mean, there is that. And that is a common complaint with people. Oh, I'm not even complaining. But, I'm just saying, like, uh, I think that that is a, I'm not, I'm not, that's not a value judgment. It's a, mm-hmm. like, that's just why I didn't know the other people's names as well. If we're being fair, Discovery, with its shorter episode count, is doing what every other Star Trek show would have done and did do, for the most part. Like, TNG was basically the Picard and Data show. Right. And then, every once in a while, you know, Worf would get a couple episodes. There's one major difference, and that is Uh that Discovery is not about the captain. Right. So, every other Star Trek show has sort of centered around the captain Mm -hmm. and then maybe one other standout character that that was a fan favorite like Spock or Data um, or Seven of Nine. uh, The Doctor. Yes. Uh, So it's uh, basically characters with like uh, trying to become more more human or less human or whatever. (laughs) (laughs) The character that shows us our humanity as opposed to all of the human characters who don't seem to have any personality whatsoever. <laughs> well, I think I think that part of the reason they're all fan favorites is because they're outsiders. And I think a lot of Star Trek fans mm-hmm. consider themselves a little bit outsider. And there's a little bit of like, oh, I see what Data's doing. Because I, 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 t- I, I mean, and there's a, there's a, there's a, that sort of geek personality type where like you kind of don't get humanity fully and like you feel a little different than everyone else. And I think everyone does to some degree, but there's a certain, yeah. certain strain of that in the sort of geeky community and sci-fi fan community that like, mm-hmm. you know, we, we, we watch, we watch those characters and we go, yeah, I get, he doesn't exactly fit in, but he's, he's valued for other reasons. And I, I connect and respond to that, you know? Right. I mean, I know I related to it when, you know, I saw Data playing poker with Stephen Hawking. I thought, I did that just last week. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, who, who, who doesn't? Uh, uh, but yeah, no, I think that's, that's my point. My point is, previously the shows have been about the captain, which made them tend to be about whatever the mission was. Yeah. And then whoever was important to the mission would kind of get featured from week to week. This show is not generally about the captain. It's about whatever Burnham's doing up until this mm-hmm. season. And this season has felt a lot more about the ship and the show. And it's it's felt a lot more ensemble, I guess. More more traditional. It has felt more ensemble. I will give it that. Yeah. Though, to be fair, in the previous seasons, the ensemble was a little different. Like... And we're still dealing with some of that. Like you had freaking Jason Isaac's character, who I, for some reason, can't remember his name anymore. <laughs> Captain Lorca. <laughs> Lorca. Lorca. Lorca was there, and he was like such a huge chunk of the show. And then last season, Pike was there. Pike and Spock and Number One were there, and they were huge parts of the show, just like sucking up any time that hmm. poor Detmer or or Owo or anybody could have you know, possibly had. Yeah. Um, I guess that's a good point that like some of these guest appearances that, that have lasted an entire season have kind of like mm-hmm. Spock, Spock and uh, Pike and Lorca. And yeah, that's and a good point. There's Giorgio. She's consistently there. She's been a guest star for two damn years. So <laughs> 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 they've been trying to spin her off for two years, man. Yeah, it's true. Um, it's true. So, you know, I think I, and not to mention Ash Tyler, yeah, no, I, I, was, I agree. You know, there, gosh, there have there been was... other characters, but that that all of that to say the the sh- and I guess these other characters were always sort of some form of what was going on instead of the status quo. If that makes sense, mm-hmm. like all all four of those characters you mentioned are all uh, characters that like they're part of what's going on. Pike is not on discovery. He's just like a guest captain because they yeah. need the ship. And then, uh, Ash Tyler is part of the plot as much as he is a character, you know, mm-hmm. you've got all this going on and, and the, definitely the same thing with, uh, with basically all those characters you mentioned. And so like, I guess uh, like Lorca, we're, we, we never really got things from Lorca's perspective. We, we were always seeing Lorca through the eyes of Burnham. And, and so, like I said, it all just is how close are yeah. you to Burnham? Are you, are you part of her mission? Are you part of the mystery yeah. she's trying to solve? Then you're like, you're, you're central to the show. And this year they, they have less of that going on. And now it's actually like kind of a core crew is emerging. Well, I don't think they have less of, the mis- whatever mystery Burnham is trying to solve. No, no, I'm saying there's less. There's not a character that is that mystery. Lorca was mm. that mystery. Ash Tyler was that mystery. Uh, and and season two was not that. Season two was more like it, it was her navigating the relationship between like uh, this new captain and how what he would do with the ship. You know. Yeah, you know, I just there is whether it's taken, um as a criticism or not, I do somewhat take issue with the, with the argument that everything is about Burnham because while that is kind of there and it, it, it is there, but you know, look at how much we've gotten of Stamets and Culber and, and Tilly. And, you know, it is somewhat about like who's in Burnham's orbit because she is the the lead, but yeah. at the same time is also like, it's unfair, I feel, to say that it's the Michael Burnham show because it's not. It's they yeah. have done a really good job of like roping in lots of different people. No, I wasn't saying again. You know, not a criticism. I'm just and not I, a criticism. I'm saying it. It's a shift in the direction of the show to now. I feel like this show is about what is happening to Discovery, and Burnham mm-hmm. is a part of that tapestry. And as previously, it was like about what was happening to Burnham, and all these characters were kind of. Whatever, whoever was orbiting her was sort of more related to the story than anything else. Um, I, again, yeah. not a criticism. I just think it's yeah, pretty no, no, no. clearly like, yes, all those characters have had more time to be fleshed out, but it's like the guy she betrayed who had to learn to trust her again, the best friend, uh, the her direct report. Like, these are the people that we've gotten to know the last few seasons mm-hmm. because they were all her direct people that were directly in contact with her. Do you feel like they've wasted a lot of time on the show? No, 
Like like I said, none of this is a uh, Chris. I'm, I'm, I know. I'm I'm just asking you, man. Just I, just say, asking you a thing. You know, I, do, I don't <laughs> think they okay. wasted time. I think they made some bad choices. I wouldn't say they wasted time though. Yeah, I'm I'm not sure. I'm not sure how I feel like thinking back on all of the people they were fleshing out that we just don't have anymore. Well, but those people, <laughs> those people allowed us to, and, and I think Ash Tyler's still around. I think we'll see him again. If not this show, possibly on a section 31 show, or possibly on a, oh, the, on a yeah. Pike show on strange mm. new worlds. Like Ash Tyler is still kicking around in the universe. Um, and so are Pike and number one, like they've made characters that are going to be around. It'd be hilarious if discovery's biggest legacy was just spinning off lots of other shows. <laughs> it would not be the first would not be the first to uh to show to be that way i don't think any of that time was wasted because it was uh they all related to those seasons and they all i think lorca's character was incredibly important to the story of season one you know yeah we needed him we need he was a villain he was a great villain that they mm-hmm. took an entire season to build and i that's that's awesome i love that yeah yeah i i don't know i i there are a few things that I would have changed, but overall, I, I really have enjoyed Discovery, and I've really enjoyed, you know, I like when we, we when they do season long arcs, Me and too. then like huge things are changed. By you know, if you look back three, if you're three seasons in, you look back and you're like, oh my god, I forgot about all those people that died or moved on and did this and yeah. this, and or just like look like, at the show and see what it is now versus what it was then. You know, right? Yeah, I am. I am not a huge on status quo on on dramas. Yeah, me neither. So, I think we're, we've know. talked about that pretty ad nauseum. That's that's the major reasons why we like the Star <laughs> Treks that we like so much. Is I and, and I mean, you know, we were watching that documentary recently about uh, DS Nine uh, drove this yeah. point home. But like that that documentary talks a lot of what we left behind. Talks a lot about how. It was sort of a trailblazer in the overarching plot uh, department, not even just mm-hmm. for Star Trek, but for TV in general. And me and you, I, I, that was our formative years for television, you know? So that was some of the stuff that we really, as adults, like we were really biting our teeth into as young adults, you know? And yeah. so, like, for me, this is the kind of Star Trek I've always loved. And when I look back and just uh, the, the reason DS9 is my favorite and the reason Voyager is one of my least is because of the way they allow for change. Right. And even like the original series, like when I was growing up and I found out about the movies, like all of a sudden they were paying off stuff, all the stuff from the original series. And they're like old men now. And I'm like, oh, this is so good. Yeah. 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 Look at how much they're paying off. Yeah. (laughs) The insanity of and I'm not saying it's going to sound insulting to the original series, uh, but I don't mean it that way. But the insanity of like. This fun little star, this little star sh- wagon train to the stars show that had was hit or miss. It, it, what's that? What's that Futurama joke? It's like, uh, 90- <laughs> you know, there were 70, sorry, 79 episodes, about 30 good ones. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's fairly <laughs> accurate. Like, it's not wrong. Like, it's, no. a, it's a super imaginative <laughs> show, but there's some shit in there and there's some great Futurama stuff. Futurama is never wrong about that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Those writers are fans. <laughs> yeah. So like, I think that's, that, that is true. And, um, but you can't say that show is not a status quo show, you know, like, Oh it, yeah. No. It is, it is, this is the most status quo of all the Star Treks, but to say, to take that little wagon train to the stars weekly episode show and then turn it into a set of movies that are so, uh, you know, serialized, and like have these overarching plots that like go not just not even just like from movie to movie and characters, but like, you know, this uh, the second one ends or uh, the third one ends. They're on a uh, Klingon bird of prey and they stay on that Klingon bird of prey for the next ep- movie, you know? Yeah, it's great. I love that kind of stuff. I absolutely love that kind of stuff. Mm hmm. And I just I, I love the notion of looking at, you know, you had three years, three seasons of young men, as McCoy would put it in, in Star Trek Two, galloping around the galaxy. And then what happens to those people when the mission is over? That's mm-hmm. so depressing. And you see it in Kirk. Like, yeah. he's 50 years old. He's depressed. He he doesn't know who, uh, he barely knows his son. His son, you know, doesn't know him. He doesn't have a family. He's And that continues on through generations. Like, 
I love how every even even Star Trek five looks at like the purpose of life after their travels and like where they are like on, you know, in Star Trek six there, you know, what do we do with these prejudices? We've, we've earned throughout our travels. Yeah. What now? What, what, what a slippery slope that turned out to be. We, we went right back to the old ways. Like, Oh my God, it's just so good. So like, <laughs> we were, we were, we were pushed into this, into this from a young age. I, I swear. Yeah, man, I, I'm, I'm fully with you. And I, I, I think it's so cool that they pivoted that way. And that pivot, I think allows for what we have now, you know, mm-hmm. um, it, well, clearly it does. It, it if they hadn't been able to do that, like, would we have been able to see the serialized nature of something like DS9 that then led into, you know, Enterprise and this? Anyway, that's a weirdly large scope discussion for what we're here today to do, which is break down the Sanctuary, Season 3, Episode 8. Mm-hmm. By the way, I, speaking of large scoping to scope discussions, when does this season end? We got 13 episodes? Um, yes. So it should be end or ending right around the end of the year, or the beginning of mm-hmm. Jan- in January. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and and there's no trek after that, right? Um, I mean, not that I know of. <laughs> well, yeah, we nothing's been announced yet, and with COVID delays, it looks like we're gonna get a little bit of a break. You hate to say it like that, but yeah, <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, break from content. But uh, I, I was thinking, I know what you mean. But. I was thinking we might try to tackle some of the movies <laughs> in the break there. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, know, I know we've talked about it. And we just haven't had the time, and uh, we just need to make time and add, yeah. act like it's another episode of Discovery. Yeah, out that's, or what, that's what I'm thinking. So let's uh, yeah, let's try to make that happen. We will. You guys Start whacking away. If yeah. you guys want to want to hear that, let us know. Uh, we'd love to. I'd love to tackle all the movies. Uh, yep. Either you know, and, and even I think it'd be really cool to start at the beginning and tackle a few key episodes of original series, maybe. Sure. Just, just a few key ones, like pick pick top five kind of thing, and just sort of talk about the themes and things that happen in those five, and then tackle the movies, and then kind of move through move through the series that way. What do you think? Um, yeah, I'm I'm down with that. What do you? I'd love to do the whole thing, but it's just going to take. We discussed it. If we did it a week every once every week, it would take like thirty years. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> we we should figure out what that thirty is that Futurama was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's let's try, let's try for like a top five because I do want to get into the movies, and if we pick uh-huh. too many, we're never going to make it to the movies. Yeah. Um, anyway, if you guys have your recommendations, how about that? You guys hit us up with your favorite episodes, and and we'll try to put together a list and pick those yeah. top five. Yeah, you, you maybe actually you guys yeah. have a special request. T- and tell us your I'll top just... five. That that's actually really fun. You guys yeah. send in your top five original series episodes. I'm sure you Absolutely. have a top five, Dave. I don't oh, think sure. I do. I, I, I've you, well, seen, you would have had to have seen five episodes. I have seen five have episodes. <laughs> I've seen all the episodes, but I just, it's, it was, I was a child and don't really, I didn't watch them 15 times like you did, but like I, I've only watched, uh, I've only watched the whole series once and then uh-huh. kind of uh, here and there after that. So, yeah. And it was like yeah. marathoning it and it all kind of blurs together. So, right. See, it's, it, it's, it's, it will be tough. It will be hard for me to sit down and because I have like my top five, like these are the best. And then I also have like my top five. These are, you know, my favorites because they're so bad. And, you know, like, well, that, I, I that'll have be a different, different conversation. Let's go for bests. Uh, let's try to get the best <laughs> of them and, and tackle that. And maybe we'll do like a top five worst or like funniest to tackle episodes. Yeah. But, you know, it's. God, you know, there there are some that you just you you hate to like you hate to bash because yes, they're silly. But they're the message is so good. You know what I mean? Mm, like right. <laughs> like the, the the first one that comes to mind is like the, the let that be your last battlefield where the you half know, uh, half white half, half black, black people. half white guys. Yeah. Yeah. That uh, they're it's like they're so white on the, on the left side of the face. Yeah. It's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Anyway, let's get we to should it. Talk about let's sanctuary. Which, let's... by the way, the last episode of Discovery is uh, January seventh. Okay. So cool. I'm gonna. I have a lot 
stuff i'm trying to wrap up the end of the year but yeah like let's uh let's 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 keep it let's keep this trek cast moving weekly because I, I i've missed it when we didn't do it so yeah and and when when there's a break we tend to do break on the show and yeah and, and no sometimes that we need a break uh sometimes we have other creative things we've got to do but i really would like yeah. to keep this moving if we can yep so i'm i'm down with that man that sounds fun yeah let's let's try let's try our best uh okay guys Let's we have uh, the sanctuary. Uh, we get to see Books Planet. What did you think? Mm-hmm. Books Planet. We've we've heard a little bit about Books Planet and his people. Yeah, we saw some trees. Um, <laughs> we didn't see a lot. Yeah, we got a little bit of his culture. We find out his brother is uh, we found out a little bit about their relationship. We found out his brother is kind of taking this heel turn and thrown in with Osira. Which kind of he just felt like Calvin Hudson light or something. I don't know like, who that is. Uh, remember the bit from the the Maquis episode of Deep Space? It's a two parter, Deep Space Nine, where like uh, Cisco's old buddy, like Vaguely. he goes to like he goes to find his buddy Cal Hudson. And he turns, oh, Cal's leading the Maquis now. Very, this whole thing, very vaguely. Yeah, it's like that's the big like they get down to the planet, and then Cal comes out with the phasers, and he's like, "No, not you." Of uh, yeah, I do remember that. That's what it felt like. Again, it's it's been a long time. It's okay. I'm just I'm trying to ease you into this, man. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ease me in. I'm I'm fully in. It's just been a long time. Like an old man into a warm bath. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's see. Uh, I really liked the conversation we got with. Um, I just it, yeah. I was watching this with Alyssa as I often do, uh, and she uh-huh. was commenting Who's how that? much. <laughs> My girlfriend, Alyssa, uh, oh. she was commenting how much she loved uh, Giorgio. She of just course. hasn't really seen much of Giorgio, I guess. Uh, and, and she really was enjoying like all the just like she was like, I love her. <laughs> <laughs> um, just like all That's the fun. I'm going to kill you stuff. Uh, and I was like, oh, yeah, she's the she's the show's spike. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. By the way, did you notice that this episode was directed by Freaks? I did actually, yeah, yeah. I just like to point that out when it happens. Yeah, it's, uh, he's doing it a lot. <laughs> it seems like he's doing a lot of episodes, and I love it. Yeah, man, always yeah. good, always really good. Um, and I love that she called him out. Like I've been picking on Culber over the last few episodes for being a little too the sage. Yeah, he's the sage. <laughs> he's Guinan. So he's so, so, so insta Guinan all of a sudden, and. um I love that she was like, you see yourself as a hero, don't you? Oracle of the mess hall. <laughs> <laughs> that is a well hung lantern. Yeah, I loved it. I loved it. <laughs> Oracle of the mess hall. <laughs> <laughs> I just wish he had come back with, I died. I have thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, we, they also had a, they did a call out to a trans warp. I think they call it a trans warp tunnel in mm-hmm. this. They said, uh, we, uh, they said they're trying to get to where they need to go. And they say, uh, we can't get there by this. We don't want to risk discovery, but we only have a 50% chance of surviving a trans warp tunnel, uh-huh. which I thought was interesting. Cause they're just, I guess, calling out the fact that like, I guess trans warp trans warp doesn't use dilithium, right? I have no idea. I don't know. It just sounds like they still haven't cracked trans warp technology. I mean, if they, I don't know what they were using. Like there was the slipstream technology, um, from Voyager. Mm-hmm. That was a Borg thing, but I would assume dilithium was involved. Well, and transwarp was also a Borg thing, but they yeah. they just said here we have a fifty percent chance of just surviving a transwarp tunnel, as if like that's always an option we have. This thing that we don't want to do. I just thought it was an interesting yeah. sort of tech, like call out to for some reason they can't, they still haven't cracked trans warp, even though it seems like the Borg did it a long time ago. Yeah, but you know, to uh, Star Trek three, they had a, a trans warp ship. It was the oh, Excelsior, and Scotty freaking sabotaged it. I think it's a and different trans warp. Yeah, though. they have said it was a different trans warp. Yeah, but to be clear. That is for story purposes. Like they, they just called it the same thing later and said, "Oh, this is different than the 23rd century transport." So, I mean, all I'm saying is we could just put that 
right into the same category. This is a different trans warp than the one they couldn't crack in the 24th century. Sure. I just took it as yeah. this is them saying like they're probably, they're telling the fans who are like, well, if warp doesn't work, why haven't you tried trans warp tunnels? Like they were doing in, you know, they, they rode in some trans warp uh, conduits. Right. In and I've definitely Voyager. seen people bring that up. Right. And so it, it was interesting that they called it out that that's, that's why they don't do it. I don't know. I just liked it. I like to, call out oh big big headline this episode you were completely right about the melody yeah uh at least that it connects not necessarily how it'll all shake out but yeah and we we've got some feedback about that and we can just go ahead and talk about that if you don't mind sure yes jump to the melody uh a little trank said question what ship is at the heart of that nebula hmm well there's a melody going on and there's a ship that's in the middle of the nebula that's sending out an SOS. Do, do we think it's Discovery? Okay. It is probably a duplicate Discovery from that will wind up being in Calypso. Mm-hmm. That has not been upgraded. That way, Calypso can happen and Discovery can continue for however many years CBS All Access wants to continue for. Right. My personal hope um, is, and you're going to hate me for saying this. Don't know. My personal hope <laughs> is it is a Starfleet vessel from pre-discovery TOS era who saw their entire timeline get wiped out by the temporal war and got caught in some kind of bullshit temporal wake. And as they're slowly meticulously getting ripped apart, they're playing that melody to calm the crew like the Titanic. Hmm. Having the band play as they sank. And um, is echoing across the, 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 the galaxy. Interesting. <laughs> uh, my mind, I, li- I like the idea that it could be some remnant uh-huh. of the temporal war. It could be some last, uh, I would, I would say it's more likely the, the, but it, it's totally Discovery. <laughs> it, <laughs> I hope not. I hope it's not Discovery, but that's like where my mind immediately goes because this show likes to eat its own tail. Um, but every show these days likes to eat its own tail. Uh, since yeah. Fight Club, nothing is yes. nothing is not yourself. <laughs> yourself is always the bad guy. Um, <laughs> right. like the late 90s and early 2000s introduced what is commonly referred to as the mindfuck genre where it's just like Donnie Darko fight club, uh, you know, uh, usual suspects like yep. every, every dramatic movie has to have like some crazy, let's not forget the, the works of M night Shyamalan. Oh yeah. Um, oh yeah. Every, like suddenly everyone in Hollywood rewatched a couple of old twilight zone episodes and went, Oh wait, yeah um so so i like your idea though like we're we're post temporal wars some sort Uh of temporal war remnant is in there and uh, maybe around the because i I don't know when these temporal accords were do we know exactly yeah i don't know um, I'm sure they told us, but I don't have a, I don't have it right. pulled up. Or, I'm just thinking, and I don't know when I, where I would look. I'm wondering, that. I'm wondering how long after the temporal cold war or the, you know, the temporal wars mm-hmm. did the burn happen and was it in some way related? Like there was the temporal cold war, right? That was in, what was it? The 30th century. Okay. So that's 2,900 something. <laughs> And then, like the the burn happened, what was it, a hundred years ago, or so? A little, it was less than two hundred years ago, right? I think they said like a hundred and twenty or so. But I, I'm worried. Oh, well, not worried. I'm wondering if the temporal cold war is the same as the temporal wars. Right. They called it temporal wars. I'm assuming the temporal cold war heated up, and it caught it went as it, it went to to actual war. At some mm-hmm. point. Um, so anyway, my point, my point being, I, I think it, it, it lines up <laughs> that this, this could be a remnant from the temporal wars mm-hmm. somehow. And they're doing something that's causing uh, some damage uh, to, to the, to our timeline. Uh, and if that's the case, then the burn could have been some sort of actual attack from another, off another universe. Right. 
I'm I'm hoping the burn it was not meant to be an attack of any kind. I'm hoping it was like maybe it is part of that SOS and it's just like they were trying to tell them something. They didn't mean to do the dilithium thing, but the temporal nebula did some kind of weird bullshit. And, you know, they totally do devil in the dark where, you know, they're like, she's not trying to kill the miners. She's trying to protect her, protect her children. Um, right, right, right. It's possible. I, I don't know. I, I'm really interested because I think that this season has been so good so far yeah. and I'm just enjoying all of the world building. And it's like, you know, you talk about the Shyamalans and the, and the, the, the 90s, 2000s stuff. I am, I think that the show that has changed everything again for us, uh, is, you know, we had all that. I think the breaking bad model is the better model now. Yeah. Um, because it's just based on the characters are in the story. The characters are in this situation. What mm-hmm. would this character, if they were a real human being, what would they do? And how do those right. stories interact? And that's, that's kind of the kind of storytelling I'm, I'm super interested in now. Um, mm-hmm. so I'm less interested in like the big mystery being revealed to be, you know, it was you all the time or whatever. Um, well, right. I love that kind of stuff. I especially loved it when I was a teenager and it was kind of like new to me. Um, or at least it wasn't it wasn't old to me. I guess is what I mean. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, but yeah, I'd, I'd love to see. I'd love to see that this is just an outcropping of something that we 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 could know. You know, it's an action. Yeah, I mean, I I do remember us. You know, I, <laughs> you and me when we were watching DS Nine and Voyager and stuff. Like, oh, what does this mean? And then it wouldn't turn out to be really anything. You're like, oh, all right. <laughs> like that wasn't anywhere near as cool as any of our theories. And, but then like people like us went on to create stuff like lost. And I don't know. I think that had a big, I think that brought back a lot of Sterling type of storytelling in some ways. For sure. For sure. Uh, it st- still wouldn't always pay off in the ways that you no. want it to. And, and sometimes you feel like your theories are better than theirs, but th- this, I, I, and that's, that's why I like podcasting about this stuff. I love to have these conversations and just like dig down on what the theory, what the theories could be. But I, but at the same time, I don't really, um, I'm not looking for a big twist. I just want something interesting. You know, I want interesting things to be, ha- I want interesting decisions to be being made by interesting characters, you know? Yep. Um, which brings us to like Osira. Yeah. Uh, I'd like her to be a little less mustache twirly maybe, but also it, mm-hmm. it makes sense. She's just a despot in this area of space where she now has about as much power as the Federation. It seems like she's not scared mm-hmm. of the Federation at all. No, I mean, she, when she killed her nephew, I was just like, Oh, and you took him in. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, there's no redemption for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She's, She's pretty dang mustache twirly. Yeah, like just I mean, I'm I'm glad they went that way with her because, you know, they could have they could have had like a big, you know, fat guy like just like eating a chicken leg or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, she's and definitely you're just like, okay, well he's not like a guy from the south. Right. You know, he's not like Colonel Sanders or something. I actually did like <laughs> I, I, owning I, slaves. I, yeah. It crossed my mind at one point that it hadn't crossed my mind that she was a lady. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> yeah, no, it sort of sort of sort of uh uh you know, it, I guess it took me a while to be like that's a lady villain. Does that make sense? Like it, she's just a villain and I like that like they didn't they didn't they didn't make her uh, her gender part of the conversation in some ways, you know, I don't know. Mm-hmm. She just is, is, is a despot and like, it just, it's an interesting character. She did have a little bit of characterization there, which I liked. She says, my ancestors right. knew it talks about the, uh, Saru being, a, uh, like you would think of everything as enslavement. And she's like, my ancestors knew that power is virtue and the, there is no nobility in suffering. Mm hmm. And uh, I just I just thought that line was cool. Power is virtue. Like it, it, she has been on her 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 ancestors were enslaved, and she has been on the other side of that, and yeah. she's she's refusing to be that again. So there's there's a little more there's a little more to her than just the uh, the the mustache twirl, I guess. Right. 
Right. Uh, so far there is like they, 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 they opened the blinds a little bit and let us get a peek. Yeah. At, like an actual character there. Yeah. At least there's a motivation there that we can like kind of understand like this is this is the culture she is from. And this mm-hmm. is who she's become because of that. And and she power is a virtue like her power is virtue. That's crazy. I would like us. I would like something of a map or or an. Or a timeline of the the Orion uh, culture, because, you know, obviously in, in original series time, we were like, oh, Orion slave girls, they were slaves. But then in Enterprise, it was revealed that the slave girls actually have some sort of like mind manipulation and they're not really the slaves. They just pretend to be the slaves while controlling their quote unquote masters. Yes. So. I'm curious if that was like lost. If right. That notion well, was lost even to the Orions over the years. Well, no. Well, that's the thing. Uh, it, every, if it every, she never says that like, they're enslaved. Right. She never says they're enslaved. That's what Saru says. And she, she mm-hmm. responds with our, my ancestors knew that power was a virtue. Um, so like, I think, I don't think that conflicts with that. Right. We know from enterprise at all. Right, right, right. It's kind of fascinating because it's the two of them looking back on history and having a different set of facts. Uh, mm-hmm. From what I understand, your people were enslaved because because we're talking about a, a guy who is from Kirk, like almost directly that time, and he yeah. uh, he uh, he probably knows them as Orion slave girls, and mm-hmm. you know he doesn't know that fact. And I thought I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, it, it, that conversation them having it from two different angles is neat. Yeah, I can get behind it. Me too. I loved Saru talking about his catchphrase. <laughs> Wasn't that amazing? <laughs> because that is totally like a thing that like one, that's the thing like as like I have created fan fiction for Star Trek or started writing it anyway and thought and like had my own characters and just thought like, what, what would my, what does my captain say when he, when he wants people to do things? I've totally had that, that thought and that conversation with myself. I've had that conversation with other fans. Like, okay, what would he say? Okay, well, if we did that, like, I, I, yeah, that's a fun thing. That's so fun. Yeah, it really was. To actually just, you know, kind of like nudge the fourth wall just a bit and have Saru worried about it. Nudging the fourth wall is part of it, but also we finally have a captain that is sort of like <sighs> geeky enough. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> that we're seeing his inner life a little bit. I feel like every captain we've ever had has kind of been a little bit of a stoic figure. Yeah, but how did they get there? Like seeing that, you just wonder, like, God, what what pains did Picard did Picard go through to figure out what he was going to say? Like, you don't just say, you know, engage for no reason or make it so for no reason. I absolutely agree. But I think that, like, <laughs> that's what's so neat is we have this sort of still cooking captain. He's still cookie dough, man. I know. He's still baking. Um, <laughs> I know the Buffy reference. <laughs> <laughs> so you can't eat her yet. I mean, whoops. <laughs> All right. Um I really enjoyed all the Ren stuff. I kind of hope Ren sticks around now. Me too, man. I like that guy. I just like, I've really enjoyed the first two seasons of the show, uh, especially on this, the, the rewatch we did. Um, but man, I'm excited about all the other characters. Like I really am. I know we did, we talked, discussed it at nauseum up top, but like the, I really am enjoying getting like a, because now that we're going deeper on a broader base of characters we're seeing all these other sort of like flavor characters it felt like a lot of these other characters were flavor characters around burnham and now like the the other characters are getting deeper and now we're getting to know these even broader scope of characters like ren um like Mm -hmm. book's brother like i just i just really love it really really love it um i loved uh detmer telling him uh you know you you stood up to her and you're the only one that's ever stood up to her yeah. Do I have that right? And he's like, yeah. And she's like, then I have the right co-pilot. I just need you to be brave a little longer. Yeah. And I enjoyed the hell out of all of her piloting and, and 
getting her getting her groove back. Yeah, you me know. too. <laughs> I love it. He's just telling her friends, and then I went full manual, and they're all like, "No!" And then he she 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 says, "Right, Ren," and then he gives her like this really like sort of like gleeful thumbs up, like, "Yeah, sure." <laughs> like he looks sort of sarcastic almost. <laughs> yep, that was uh, awesome. That was fantastic. Oh, and the cat, Ren with the cat. Yes. Uh, I, yeah, I was pleased with all of that. I love that the cat like jumped out. She was like, what the hell? <laughs> She's like, what is that thing? My, my girlfriend also uh, has never owned a cat in her life uh, and has is a little fearful of them and doesn't understand them, you know? Uh, uh-huh. Like, so when they make a noise, she can't tell if it's friendly or not. You know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, and he I've just, lived with a cat for three years, and I still can't tell. <laughs> well, he, he she just, I think he said a line in there, and I'm trying to remember what it was. It was something to the effect of, like, Wait, what is that noise it's making? <laughs> something like that. And it's like, that's exactly a line that she said before. And it just cracked me up. Uh, that's fun. It was great. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um... What else you got, man? Oh, I can keep going. I was just trying to like not going. totally control everything here. Try not to be a control freak. No, you, you're welcome to. That's what I like about this this show is like I got to be the control freak over on DC on screen. <laughs> well, I just I just follow my notes here. Uh, I, I I really enjoyed the uh, relationship between Book and his brother, and it was like really touching when they decided to get you know, get down and be, be empaths together and solve yeah. the problem for their planet. Uh, and it made me so happy to see, to see them working together and to see book book talks in this episode about wanting to, he says, this is where they're making a difference. He said, this is my, uh, that, that'll always be my home, but this is where they're making a difference for planets like this. And I he am, said, I want Yeah. I, I want like in. being around that. And then she, he tells Burnham later, I want to be in, I want in. He wants to be in the Federation, which we've talked about before, and we were kind of torn on it. You were like, I don't really want Federation book. I like weird, you know, smuggler book. But like. Yeah. No, they, he he sold me on his reasoning, though. Me too. Me too, man. It, which, like, that made me love him more and made me love the Federation more because, like, ah, it's just it's just great. It's just great, man. This is this is like if we had I felt like I had gone almost like I had gone six or seven seasons and suddenly, you know, Mal Reynolds wanted, wanted into the Alliance because they were finally on the right, right track. Right. Right. Like just finally sees a good look from them. And you know, it, it all makes me curious about where the, what's happening with the Federation because, and what's going to happen with all these relationships because this relationship to the Federation and who the Federation is and d- Discovery's version of the Federation and how it relates to this century's version of the Federation. Like book has seen what they are doing, but then what if this version of the Federation decides to do something much different or darker or, or like, I hate saying this, but I'm scared that books planet is doomed. Yeah. Yeah. They chose to fight against Osira. Osiris yeah. doesn't stand for that. Um, and, and she's on her last leg. Uh, Rin tells Detmer this episode that the chain, or no, uh, Tilly, does he tell Tilly? I think that um, the chain is running out of dilithium. Yeah, the emerald chain. And they're going to want, they're going to want discovery. Of course, we talked about the last episode, how as soon mm-hmm. as they discover this other form of travel, someone's going to want it. And Osira is yeah. a, a clear candidate now, uh, and they're just like making enemies like with with Osira left and right, like the way they, you know. <sighs> I just I, I'm worried for the entire Federation because Osira seems so strong, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you think we'll get like some like balls out? We had no idea this was even still a thing. Day X Machina from the futuristic Fenris Rangers. <laughs> Interesting. I've been waiting on that all all season. It's just like futuristic Fenris Rangers. Yeah, like thirty second century Fenris Rangers. Why not? Why not? We've already got Kuat Malat. That's kind of why I don't trust them not to do it. <laughs> right. I don't think we'll get that because I think Fenris Rangers is probably like a pretty specific thing to a specific time. But 
Uh, Maybe. Who knows? I, they definitely could have like future centuries counterparts. I, I kind of feel like that's what book is to some degree. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like book was already the guy going around trying to do good um, in a world where the Federation didn't exist. And so that's kind of the, already the character we met. Like mm-hmm. I could, I would not have put it past them to, for him to be wearing like a Fenris Ranger patch on one of his like satchels or something like mm-hmm. where it's like people that he respected in the path from the past or something. Right. Like, which I'd be down for. I think that's cool. <laughs> the fi- the 32nd century Fenris Rangers controlled by the Borg, the Borg queen Seven, nine, of course. Absolutely. And then you're just like, what happened, Seven? Oh. I kind of love the idea of like <laughs> Seven realizing she can control the Borg. We, we, get, we, get, a, we, uh-huh. get, we get a Seven show, right? Like, or, or, a, or a show that features her heavily, more, more of her on Picard, whatever. And like two mm-hmm. or three seasons in, she's, she, we know she can control the Borg now. We know she can sort of become their queen if she wants to be, right? Yeah, man. So she goes, to, she realizes. It's kind of like an, an absolute power color ups situation where like she keeps realizing that like the things she needs to do, like she can't do alone. She can't do without the power of the Borg and like whatever thing she thinks is worth it. She ends up going back in and becoming the Borg queen and like or, 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 or taking over some portion of the Borg to go f- maybe fight the Borg. Like what if she what if she takes over like a quadrant's worth of Borg to go like go wage a war against the Borg because they're in causing incursions into their, you know, Federation space again or whatever. Yeah. But it wouldn't be like in my head, it wouldn't be like, a, like there, there would be nothing organic left of her. Like in my head, she was just, she would be like the, uh, she would be made of the, uh, it would basically just be her, 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 uh, her consciousness and, and, uh, the programmable matter. Like a programmable matter seven of nine. <laughs> yeah. But we also got in a previous, uh, you know, in, in incarnation of the Borg Queen, we got that mm-hmm. version where, like, even though she blew up on in first contact, we see that version of the Borg well, Queen yeah. again. So you could see a, a situation where they, like, rebuild her in, the, in a similar way with, you know, may at least make her look similar out in space somewhere. Right. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. That's fine. Um, and no, we didn't see her blow up. We watched her skin get eaten by freaking. Oh, that's right. Gas. That's right. That's right. Um, that like dissolves flesh. And then he like organic material broke her neck uh, of her like robot self. Right. Right. Man. God, I, I really like Osira. <laughs> I know. I, I really I, like John. I really like John McClane Picard. <laughs> well me too um but uh i really like osira her like <sighs> trying to threaten the brother and says all right then famine uh you have children right have you ever seen a child starve it's just like mm-hmm. so evil but then at the same time like i kind of get her point when she's talking to uh saru and and he's telling her you know uh I forget what he says. Dang. Uh, he says something about the Federation and like, we don't do this sort of, the, I don't know, whatever. And she says out here, we don't bend to that kind of hubris or whatever. Like, yes, yes. Uh, like, like just pretending the Federation saying they're in charge. And she's like, no, you're not in charge of me. I don't bend to you. Like there's, yeah. there's a little bit of me that's like, yeah, I'm on her side. <laughs> yeah. Just like in serenity. Yeah. She is the Malcolm Reynolds in that situation. I don't murder children. I do. Yeah, she's the true believer, man. Yeah. Well, no, no, I, I, I disagree. She's the she's the freedom and power person. She's kind of she is the she's more of Malcolm Reynolds than an operative. Sorry to go all straight up center energy. Oh. Everybody who doesn't know, well, I don't, I don't know. I don't I know mean, if she's, I believe that she's on the opposite side of that. Like she's she's corrupted. She's evil. But like when she says she says I don't bend to that kind of hubris. That's absolutely a Malcolm Reynolds line. You know. Um, <laughs> But so she's more in the position of being the outsider who has her own thing going on. But like, but now she has this power and she's gotten it through violence. And it's like, she's like a dark mm-hmm. version of whatever that sort of like, you know, fighting against the system turns out to be. Right. I don't know. It just, she feels like the operative if he was against the Alliance for real. Hmm. Like, I, 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 don't, I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, moving on. Uh, some stuff with Adira. 
she she we get some i i wrote in my notes space jamming because <laughs> space jamming because they're jamming we, we got to see two ca- uh-huh. two characters actually jam a little bit that's kind of nice we did they weren't playing yeah, that was interesting pre pre-planned thing he's just like i'm in g play this you know g minor or whatever um, right that was kind of fun little piano mm-hmm. cello uh, par- little piano cello party um uh, also we we find out that uh Adira's, oh, and I think I may have mis mispronounced her even in this conversation. I, I just did, you did. it. Uh, but they, <laughs> them, yes. they. I'm still not used to that. I did think it was a little confusing. Okay, so I'm all on board. Them, they. Sure, great. Whatever you want to be called, I don't care. Uh, I would like a little grace because I'm tr- I, I, I'm trying, but I, I'm, I'm sometimes I'm going to mess up, as mm-hmm. I've done probably already in this conversation three or four times. Uh, but Adira. <laughs> is is going by they the the sort of like f- people who are pushing against the them they pronoun switch one mm-hmm. of their problems with that or at least the the thing they say is their problem with that is because them they is confusing because it's something we use for plural so yeah. You're, 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 you're messing that up but the language what i find weird about this particular use of they <laughs> is she is plural <laughs> Yes, I did. I, I I did notice that that was poetic. Well, it's poetic, I, but also I enjoyed when she said it. I was I didn't even know I didn't know they were going for a gender thing at all. When when she said it, I was like, <laughs> when she said, uh, "Excuse me, it's they, it's 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 them," and I was like, "What? I've never heard a trill say that they're a them. They've always been, you know." Her Jadzia was her still, and I was like, "Oh, they're going with a gender thing." I get it. I get it. Yeah, <laughs> I thought that was a that was an interesting decision to make the one character that's going to call themselves them also the only character that is multiple characters. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, now I, 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 I have. Uh, I have seen some some not necessarily blowback, but some questions as to whether, you know, in Gene Roddenberry's universe would uh that be because she said she hadn't told anyone but Gray, or they told uh they said that they hadn't told anyone but Gray. Uh why would that be even be an issue? Why would they have only told Gray uh in Gene Roddenberry's future so far in, in Gene Roddenberry's future? I get it. I think, though, sometimes stuff like that um, is deeply personal. And, you know, I am I am a straight, uh, straight male, and I didn't really want to talk about, I didn't even want to reference my sexuality when I was young, because, like... And now he won't shut up about it. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Sorry. But, no, Sorry. like, when I was, when I was a teenager, yeah, you know... I mean, it's absolutely the norm uh, in in the South, uh, especially for, you know, a guy to be a, a straight man, you know, and right. like girls. And I you still don't want to that. talk about it with other people. I, I don't want to talk about it. Yeah. Because the, once you open yourself up to that, then they, all of a sudden everybody's got like, oh, you like her. Oh, you got this going on. Oh, you're doing this. You know, your parents don't leave you alone. They hound you. You know, so much so that, you know, my dad thought I was gay for a long time. Right. And he was not pleased with that. (laughs) Um, (laughs) And I, you know, dealt with that for a long time. So, you know, I just, there are reasons you don't tell people like what you prefer and, and who you are necessarily. Yeah. People, people are private about a lot of things. Yeah. It doesn't have to be gender or sexuality at all. Um, some people just don't like other people knowing their business. But it sounds like mm-hmm. she, I don't know that that's, that's even, yeah. I, yeah, it's weird. It's, it's, it's weird that she didn't, you know, it hasn't brought it up. I, I get, there's a certain level of comfort that you want to be with someone. And sometimes you'll let things slide, it, you know. <sighs> So I, I just, I've talked to people about these sorts of issues a little bit, and sometimes they like let they, they let certain things slide and out in public. They're getting coffee, and someone misgenders them. They're not going to worry about it. But then, like in a uh, you know, it, it's someone that they know and that they would like to know them. I mean, I, I also mm-hmm. know people who like 
you know, they have Facebook filters that w- let people know that they are a certain way that, you know, either their sexual, whatever their sexuality is or whatever their gender identity, gender identity that they like yeah. certain people, they don't let into those things. And, and this is a person she's getting close. Ha, did it again. This is a person that they are getting closer to. To be fair, they have spent the entire season calling her. She, and now, <laughs> it's it's, now in just this episode, they have changed it to they. That's true. But I, I'm trying to be, I'm trying to gender her the way she would like to be gendered. I didn't, can't even do it. Can't even do it once, right? <laughs> and it's also always this uncomfortable thing. And I, I, I've been reading a lot on um, racial um, issues this year, as as many people have. And w- one of the things that like I have learned is an issue for us whites. <laughs> <laughs> Is uh-huh. that we are, especially in the South, part of the problem is we are trained that from an early age, the civil rights was solved in the 60s. Mm-hmm. So we are trained that it is sort of polite to not even mention race mm-hmm. and act as though racial problems don't exist because even just mentioning race is racist. And I have had a lot of my, the reading I've done has really pushed back on that. It's like, no, that's just a tool being used by, uh, by people to not allow, you know, not allow you to, uh, not allow you to grow because you never express the issues, you know? Well, I, I don't think it's always a tool to be, you know, used nefariously. I think people are just uncomfortable with it and they don't know what to say. Oh, no, you know? no, I'm not saying, I'm saying that, <laughs> That overall tool, like society is built that way because people yeah. don't like to talk about the problems there are. And right, so it is, right. it is, it is, it is whether and not saying like in the moment when I decide not to talk about race, I am using it as a tool for impression. Gotcha. I'm saying like it is, it is a system that has, we've been raised in to sort of like keep us from ever acknowledging the problem. And as we know from the 12 steps, acknowledging a problem is the first step. Um, and like, it's just like that whole thing. Um, but anyway, so, so, mm-hmm. so as I say all this, part of me wants to like cut out every time I misgender uh, them. But like at the same time, I'm like, yeah, no, let the let the conversation be the conversation and try to uh, try to try to just have it honestly, because I, I would I, I, I'm, I'm trying to do better with the, the sort of gender identity stuff, because it's it's it is new to a lot of us, especially where mm-hmm. we where we live here in the South in Alabama. You know, and I don't think it's just it's not real. It's not as concentrated here as we feel like we want to believe. Like I, you know, uh, Neil Adams tells a story about how when he uh, basically co-created uh, John Stewart, who was a an African-American Green Lantern, you know, in the comics in those days. They would color black people orange, right? Or like very, very tan, and they would not draw. They would draw them without lips, and you know they would just draw them as like generically white as they could. And then you know, and he was like, "Why don't we just draw them like they they are?" And his editors were like, "Well, that would." offend them right and he's like why (laughs) like why are we whitewashing these people it's so hard as a as a white person it's so we so fear being called racist that we are scared to touch race stuff at all yeah it gets easier when you realize that there are certain people who will call you racist no matter what sure sure and and there are also a lot of people who can hear hear that that you're trying you know what I mean? Like, yeah. there's, there's a lot of people yeah. that will go that it, just because someone calls you racist. And I realize where you have this whole cancel culture thing that everyone's scared of. But like, that's actually one of the reasons I like well, podcasting is because people hear us have these conversations. The people listening to this show right now are going to know we're having this conversation and we're talking about trying. And then if mm-hmm. someone took one line of us misgendering uh, Adira and go, look at this, cancel them. The people listening would go, Oh well, no, they're, they're having a conversation about it. You know, they're like, they're trying. Right. Um, whereas yeah. a lot of other forms of media, per, per Twitter, for instance, is really easy to look at and be like, look at this one tweet, take it out of context. <laughs> anyway, uh, we, we, we are, we have yep. gone way off rails here. La- my last okay. thing in my note. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, my last thing in my notes is 
Lizard. <laughs> uh, Linus is in the hallway, and the young child just says, Lizard. <laughs> Which I thought was a little racially insensitive. <laughs> I did you know. too. I did. I too. did. Like I, know. I did a little bit. I was like, "Are we really gonna have like Burnham walk up and be like, hey, let the kid pick some of your skin off your face?'" Yeah, that was like, a little. That was a little, little weird. A little iffy. I feel like there's been a couple things this season. I forget what some of the others were, <laughs> where we were just like, "Whoo, that seems that seems strange." Uh, to, that seems like a weird line to draw. Um, but yeah, that is, that, that is the idea of picking skin off his face is crazy. Um, but you know, I but, like to think that Michael has a lot to learn. She's from the 23rd century. And as we know, in the 23rd century, you know, it's perfectly okay and acceptable to give shit to aliens for being aliens. Yeah, it's true. Um, it's true. That's 23rd well, century McCoy. culture. She comes from a yeah. different time. Everyone, everyone points and laughs at you know Mr. Spock for having green blood and struggling with his human and Vulcan side. Yep. All right. <laughs> you, you got anything else before you head into feedback? Uh, uh, no. I do think that I do. I think the Federation is probably going to be evil. Yeah, or incredibly misguided, misguided, or possibly just not strong enough. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know why I, I kind of got derailed there, but I meant to get into this. Like, I think that their world is doomed. I think mm-hmm. that book will want to join. Yeah, and then when they and they don't feel strong enough to go help when Osira finally comes for his home, uh-huh. like what does that mean for him joining and what does it mean for Burnham staying part of the Federation? If the man she loves is, is is deciding to go fight for his home and, and you know, the Federation will not help. You know, I feel like a cat. Why is that? Who hasn't, who hasn't gotten used to their new owner yet? Like I have enjoyed the, the comforts of, of discovery. Uh, I enjoy, you know, the food it offers me from week to week. But I still, like, when it goes to pet me, I still shy away. Like, Mm. I'm still, like, I'm waiting for him to hurt me. (laughs) Because, like, I'm sitting there going, like, yeah, this is pretty good. But Discovery's going to wind up being the one who dismantles this current Federation and shows everyone how to be the Federation, aren't they? (laughs) That old chestnut. (laughs) Well, see, I, I don't even mind that to some degree. Uh, uh-huh. Some form of that. And I understand the Federation is in a different place than it was. And it's in a different, it has a totally different power level. And it, yeah. it just this, this like crime syndicate sounds like it might be able to take down the Federation if it wanted to, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so I understand why the ambassadors would need to make decisions. And I, I think those kinds of dramatic tension between like, are we able to help these people? It's not so much that we don't want to. We're not mustache twirly Federation, but we're right. just like, no, if we do that, then our member uh, worlds will suffer, you know? I don't know. Admiral Vance might be mustache twirly, secretly. Maybe, maybe. Like, you know, I I kind of get the feeling, and I know we haven't seen him, and I feel like it's so we'll forget about him, but that precious man who woke up every day for all those 40 years hoping the Federation would show up, I kind of feel like he's in line to be the next, like, leader of the Federation. <laughs> that's possible. Because like, he's, he's the one that knows what it's about. Well, and that's the thing, is it could be, like, that we get <laughs> a new version of the Federation that uh, Burnham is spinning off here or something. It's like, right. what, what, you know, what if we get a split in the Federation, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, when does Calypso <laughs> happen? I don't know, man. It's like... They, they, I don't know that they actually said it. They said a thousand years in the future in the in the press materials. What if Calypso is like a uh, son of Burnham and Book, the guy from Calypso? Oh shit! You mean um, you mean Quarrel or Craft? Uh, Craft is that it? Yeah. I mean, it was also Quarrel. Like they they just pulled that shit from Odyssey. Sure, sure, sure. The the aliases. Yeah, uh, because because it, it like what if. You know, we talk about this sort of split in the Federation, and in the, in the earlier episode, Book called the version of the Federation that uh, they're dealing with right now 
uh-huh. they called uh, them the Vidraish. Book called them right. that too. So what if whatever he's a part of is in a fight with the the Federation that like, um, you know, Book and Burnham are about to start, and we have like yeah. a weird dueling Federation situation. That'd be cool. I'm I'm down. Me too. I mean, Me too. I I I in in today's climate with the uh, like the political situation admi- we have the current administration sure I don't see the discovery riders making the federation the current federation like I think Vance is Trump dude like let's just get down to it I think if, <laughs> I think Vance is Trump to some degree interesting um, I do I think they're gonna they're gonna do that way go that way all right I don't, I don't, I don't see the Trump connection yet, but I, I, you just mean he's that, that like that. Yeah. His group, whoever, not necessarily mm-hmm. Vance even, but like that version of the Federation that we've been right. seeing is a, a version of the Federation that has lost a little bit is luster and they're trying, yeah. they've sort of like decided to make themselves smaller and stop doing everything they could for the outside world, which is kind of right. what, what's going on in the right wing in this country right now. Um, xenophobic uh yeah yeah sort yeah. of like uh, we have to be a little more insular now ends um, justify the means yeah help less people to to help ourselves that kind of situation yeah i do i think that's where they're where they're going with it it's and, very uh, possible very possible. i mean that's what star trek does that's what the fans like to do so when the fans who are writing the show are almost, you know, assuredly 100% Democrat, which we've pretty much been. I mean, if you follow the people on Twitter, like the writers and stuff on Twitter, I mean, that's pretty obvious. Sure. I'm not saying it shouldn't be. I'm just saying it's Star Trek. <laughs> it's like, right. what you, it, it is, as it has always been, for the most part, a very liberal property, a very progressive property, if you want to go that way with it. You want to say that? Yeah. So that's really all I've got. Okay, cool. As far as that's concerned. Cool. Okay, well, we're about to get into feedback, but before we do, we're going to drop into a quick ad break. Right, we'll be right back after this ad we have no control over. And we're back, and it's time to touch on you guys' feedback. What do we got there, Dave? I, I saw a lot of stuff coming in on the transom. Right. Well, let me let me ask you this real quick. And it's something I've always wanted, kind of wanted to do on DC on screen. And it's real dumb. It's like like Monday morning shock jock or something. But it's like, I've always wanted to be like, all right, we're going to get into the the feedback feed bag. And then like have like a noise of an animal. Um, sure. Sure. You want to do that? Sure. You want to, if I find a horse. Nay, winning. Yeah, I mean, I would prefer it'd be like a gerbil <laughs> or something. <laughs> like sort of, sort of play against type, you know? Feedback, uh-huh. feedback, and then like, yeah, you know, uh, each week it's like, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, let's not do that. This sounds awful. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. We've, we Here's one from Stu Little. He says, uh, kind of whelmed by this episode. <laughs> uh, yeah. Kind of. Do you whelmed. know that reference? No, Do I know don't. I reference? don't know the reference. I get the joke. It's, I like it. I mean, it's yeah. It's from Young Justice. Dick Grayson on Young Justice. He, you know, he 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 says, "I'm whelmed." Uh, you know, if he's the the opposite of disturbed, he's turbed. He does that. He yeah, it's All fun. Right. I like it. I like it. Um, that's a good show. I think you would like Young Justice. Uh, the most enjoyable part was Saru trying to find a catchphrase. Book and his brother and his background in general needs a lot more development than this rushed plot gave us. I disagree. I thought it was fine. I thought it was really good for what they gave us. Yeah, for what they gave us. I, I definitely, I definitely, I see where she's coming from. I want more too. But if you think about like, you know, the first episode we ever meet the Vulcan homeworld or whatever, like there's always got to be a first one and you can't get all the backstory into one. So I, I'm pretty forgiving with like, this is what this world is like. Here's a little bit of this relationship. And and I think that what I'm hoping for is that we'll get more of that and it will become more and more developed. I do think they're doomed, though, so that might not happen. <laughs> yeah, well, I think 
I think we'll get a lot more of him. Mm, maybe. Yeah, it just depends on if they're able to save them or not from their clear uh, barrage that Osiris is bringing. The clear and present danger. Yeah. yeah. Oh, but I, we didn't mention it, but like the crazy thing, <sighs> it, it shows how out of touch they are, I feel like, that... They decided, so Osira is there, and they're like, we can't mm-hmm. fire on her because we're Federation, and it will be an act of war. Why don't we send this ship out of our shuttle bay, and she'll have to respect all of our treaties. It's like, no, <laughs> no. that's. I don't think, yeah, we're, that, we've got some feedback about that, but yeah, I don't think they, that's what that was about. That's, that, well, no, that's what they said. They were like, uh, they said, if it? yes, they say, if we're supposed to, if we fire on them, it will be considered an act of war. And so, uh-huh. well, what if a non-Federation ship fired on them? They try this, like, for, sort of version of legalese in the middle of this battle, and they send book ship to do all the dirty work. Right, right, right. And then right. afterwards, no. she looks at him and goes, this is war. Like, and they go, oh, shit, she didn't respect our little legal trick? <laughs> no, but, okay. I th- I was pretty sure because they went out of their way to talk about like we are under direct orders blah 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 and then Tilly says but if a rogue crew member took a non federation ship and did the blah 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 and then I think that was basically them g- giving themselves a little leeway with Admiral Vance mm, that's not what they said. And then they that said exactly what they no, said. No, 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 no. They said if a rogue crew member did it and then we punished her. So the punishing of her would also be part of the like, hey, look, Osira, we didn't do it. This one crew member did. And don't worry, she'll be punished. And they even uh, say see, I took that as they them even saying say it that right, to Vance. They even say it right before, though. We can't we can't attack. It will cause a war. They don't say mm-hmm. we can't attack. It's not our orders. They say we can't attack. It will cause a war. I'm pretty sure. I'm 90 percent sure. Yeah, I don't know. I think it's, I think it was more about Vance. I mean, hopefully it would, you know, one of those things where you're like hopeful that it'll stick with Osira. But, you know, more than anything, you're just like, we got to do the right thing here. But you know, to cover yeah. our butt with Admiral Vance. Which, okay, you maybe you may be right. I had to, to go back and listen. To that. I thought they said the thing about war. I, I could be absolutely wrong though. It could be that uh, she said, you know, well, we can't go because that's not our orders. I don't know. I'm I'm, I'm kind of scanning through right now to see what they actually what the actual wording is because. But but either way, like it, okay, so one one of two things just happened. Then they. <laughs> Did a thing to not go to war with Osira, and then clearly Osira does not care. Or no, she doesn't care. Or they did a thing against the Federation's orders that just put the entire Federation at risk. Yeah, and also looks bad on Saru. Like Saru is in the situation of I've got to do the right thing, but either I can look like uh, I don't have control over my crew because this is the second freaking crew member who's gone rogue against my orders or I, I'm just willfully disobeying the Admiral. Like which one do you want it to be? So I wouldn't be surprised if Admiral Vance just replaced him as captain somewhere and just said, you know what? If you can't, if you can't go along with us, here you go. This is what we're doing. Um, I think there will definitely be consequences from Starfleet as well. Or there should be, because nothing about what just happened was okay. No. Um, but, you know, even if it was like Admiral Vance telling him, like, look, man, don't don't try to pin it on somebody else. You went against our orders, at least, you know, for lack of a better phrasing, have the sack to admit it. Yeah. Don't try to pin it on your pilot. And, you know, if Vance is, like, willing to put her, you know, in the line of fire and be like, you know, we're taking you out and you're not going to be a part of the Federation or Starfleet or whatever anymore. And Saru, like, falls on the sword and says, no, it was my order. You know. I mean, I don't know. That'll be interesting. Yeah. That'll be an interesting day. Yeah. (laughs) That'll be an interesting day. Okay. Uh, What else we got in the feedback? Um, let's see. Um, 
Lil Trank says, is it only a matter of time before the Emerald Chain attacks Federation headquarters? Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. No doubt about that. Uh, do you think the Navarre is behind the Emerald Chain? I feel like someone familiar is leading the chain from the shadows. Hmm. It's a Romulan cabal. Yeah, it's probably a Romulan cabal. <laughs> Isn't it always a Romulan it's cabal? It's always a Romulan cabal. Yep, yep. Uh, Lil Trank says, this episode was okay. I like Detmer going Will Smith and in Independence Day. Also like Saru trying to find a catchphrase, but they've built it up. So when he picks one, it had better be good. Right. Um, I don't think he'll get the chance. Yeah. I don't think he'll be captain for very long. Sadly, because of this episode. Personally, yeah. that's what I think. Yeah, I think you might be right. Okay, uh, by the way, it's... Uh, mm-hmm. he, he says, if we attack... Yeah, it's exactly what I said. If we attack, she will take as an attack from the Federation. And he says, mm-hmm. at this point, we have no choice. And then Tilly says, what if we uh, do the thing with the pilot?" Yeah. And so it, and that sucks. Yeah. 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 It's definitely like they think somehow this will av- absolve them of guilt with Osiro, which is just really naive. Mm-hmm. But I, I, you know, I get why they would do that because they come from a world of treaties and they can do the things that they, you yeah. know, they, they can get around thing with, with this sort of third way thinking, but like, sorry guys, Osiris just a bad guy and she sees through your bullshit. Man. Yeah. Why do I, why do I, why do I like Osiris so much? <laughs> so by the way, uh, nerd talk, Dan, uh, on Twitter had said the plan to have Detmer launch and book ship to offer plausible deniability. Doesn't work when your opponent is a crime Lord who doesn't adhere to rules. Uh, sorry, to rule of law or diplomatic norms. So call it a nerd talk. We answered the question before you got to it. No, but that's, you're right. We got Absolutely right. Nerd talk. Thank yep. you. Yeah, I, I, I was, I tried to create some head cannon. I tried to give them a little leeway, but no, mm-hmm. they, they had to. It's there. Now. And, uh, and this thing, I don't, I don't hate this. It's not like I, that's, that, that's still an interesting story. Like it's a bad decision they made. It's a dumb thing they did, but it's them learning this lesson that they are not in their time. They're used to certain rules of engagement, but this is not that world anymore. This is sort of wild frontier now. And if that's the if that's the the lesson, if we get a Tilly who is remorseful and says, "I see, I shouldn't be the number one," and then like Saru's like, "Well, then I shouldn't be a captain," and then Vance is like, "I agree." Mm-hmm. Give me give me that spore drive. Give me that spore drive. <laughs> Why am I letting a bunch of like thousand year old dudes still run the spore drive? Give me that spore drive. <laughs> you fools. Speaking of spore drive, like at this point. Speak with all this stuff we're talking about. How likely is it that Adira and <laughs> that Adira and Stamets are going to have to go on the run because she's the only one who knows how to design a uh, an interface for the for the thing that doesn't involve Stamets, and Stamets is the only one that can control the spore drive, <laughs> and they yeah. want to do atrocities or something, and like Stamets and Adira have to like go on the run together. Or something like that, or they have to do something crazy to try to like keep the keep the Federation's grubby hands off of the, or the or the or, or the Emerald Chain's grubby hands off of the Spore Drive. Yeah, I do think that's probable that they will have to do that. Yep, they all of them. Yep. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I don't. I, yeah, I didn't hear myself that time. Yep, I didn't think I did. Um, I think I did call them they mostly. Oh, mostly because I was talking about the two of them. I think I, mm-hmm. I think I didn't even call. I don't know that I spoke. You, did. Of, you said you did. You did it. You said she. All right. My bad. <laughs> I didn't even hear it. You bigot. <laughs> I'm kidding. It's fair. It's fair. fair totally fair. <laughs> Luke Thomas on Twitter says, I am getting rather tired of the formula this season, uh, this uh, hmm. the formula this, this season is taking problem spore drive Burnham chase sequence personal revelation Detmer this week emotional heart to heart the end I'd love a classic taught mystery episode solved by skill without any tears huh that is a con well okay let's 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 talk about the 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 formula first of all you know 
when you're looking at storytelling, there are lots of different formulas. Well, not really. They're like seven or so, <laughs> but I don't know. I think that's kind of a thing with the all Star Trek, all Star Trek series. And I think all Star Trek series have their preferred formula, but um, I think it has been personally, I think it's been, you know, a little, uh, it's been shuffled up enough that I haven't really noticed it too much. Yeah, I haven't either. And I, I don't feel like this has been, I like you sure sport drive is their power. So like, yes, mm-hmm. they've had to use a sport drive in every episode, but like, that's the whole point is they are the ship with the sport drive. So like every time the Federation has a, or they have an issue that needs solving sport drive wise, that's what they do. And um, by the way, sport drive is basically, the Enterprise is the only ship close enough. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's a good. That's a good point. But it's also just that's how they travel. That's how this particular ship travels. So it's like, yeah, the fact using that as part of the formula is kind of like that's like saying Batman took the Batmobile to the thing. You know, like yeah, Burnham chase sequence. That's shields up, red alert. That's all that is. This yeah, is like, or, oh, there's or, an enemy ship. They're not answering our hails, or just any, or they answer any, our hails and they're a jackass. It's the you know? it's the action sequence, and I don't, you know me, I don't really care for the action sequence unless it has stakes. And I feel like for the most part they've done a good job with stakes this this season. Yeah, um, me too. Every 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 episode, Rin with I think it was uh, two episodes ago. I really, or maybe it was last episode. I I really felt the stakes with him on that planet trying to escape. Um, in this episode, I really felt the stakes of. Uh, book's home planet and i don't know i mm-hmm. guess i guess i just i have not felt like this has been formulaic i mean last episode was yet yeah, with all that um wonderful uh touching on the past and we had a, a the, the the battle was not a chase sequence there was no chase sequence mm-hmm. last episode it was all about like them having a conversation in a room classic yep. star trek stuff like I, I i don't think this is a fair um Feel how you feel, sir. I, I yeah, I don't, sure, sure. I don't, you know, I'm, I, I, don't, I don't try to convince you. Uh, I just, I, I don't agree. I think that this has been a pretty varied season with some pretty interesting right. storytelling. I mean, like that first episode where it's just a like ex- exploration of the galaxy, being all alone, trying to find someone to trust. Like that's a cool episode, and mm-hmm. then you know. You, you got the trapped in ice. Everything's closing in around you. Uh, scared of the dark episode. Uh, you get, you got, I don't know. It's just, I think it's been full of varied and interesting episodes. There's only eight of them and two of them definitely don't have Burnham f- chase sequences. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, a uh, personal revelation that can easily be data says a thing about whatever bullshit he was doing, trying to figure out about his life. In the yeah. episode, and then Jordy goes, Data, you're a genius. If we just reverse the polarity, I mean, and then instead of a heart, emotional heart to heart, Picard says some Shakespearean shit. Right. I mean, well, and guys, I mean, this is it's all for it's, yeah, all, all tricks yeah. have formulas. Sure. Yes, they all have, they absolutely. All have, because they have characters and settings. Mm-hmm. So there's going to be some things that relate from episode to episode. Uh, but I think that like. This is way less formulaic than any other Star Trek. I, I would, I would, I, agree. I would claim this is the least formulaic season of Star Trek that has ever existed. I, I actually agree with that. If you're talking about all TV, sure, there are less formulaic things out there. There's crazier things, but like this is the least formulaic season of Star Trek I've ever seen. Um, as for wanting the classic mystery episode, I, I like the mystery episodes that we've seen on Star Trek from time to time. I, I've always loved it when they do stuff by skill, as opposed to techno babble, which is what most of Star Trek series do for yeah. the majority of their run. <laughs> they just make up some bullshit. It depends on what you mean better. by skill, because if you just mean good at future fake engineering, then like I'd yeah. rather them solve it through emotional stuff. You know? Dude, I swear to God, dude, like Star Trek writers will just be like, I've seen scripts, dude. They will just say. If we just do, and then they just like do like little brackets and say insert techno babble, and then they have like the scientific, you know, advisors come in and like make up some shit based on like the terminology they already have right in the canon. Sure, like, that's not that's not being that's not solving it by skill. Original series they would get a little tricky. Kirk would come up with some like good combination between logic and and yeah. McCoy's crazy emotionalism, but <laughs> we've definitely talked about it before, but I love yeah. when these shows narrow down the problem 
and it is a solution that you can see mm. on the table, if that makes sense. Yeah. There's, a, there's a solution yeah. that is possible in the world already. You just maybe haven't seen it yet. And then yeah. you're trying to figure it out. The skill is the decision making and then like making a good decision based on the facts that you have and and like as the viewer when it's done well as the viewer sometimes you can get there with them and it's it's very satisfying um i find yeah. and i've i found this show to be that like i i mentioned last episode already but like last episode when she decided uh the best way to do this is to just end this hearing now i was like that's exactly what you should do like i i had gotten there a little before her and before she said it and i was like yeah that's perfect and then that that led to her getting the sport the, the data she needed and i just i i love that kind of stuff it's like you have all yeah. the players involved and um and and th- this episode was a little more uh action heavy at the end um mm-hmm. but i i still i and and you could say that the use of uh the two empaths to move the um whatever the the the, the locusts back was yeah. a little bit techno babble, uh, fantasy babble, I guess. Oh, sure. It was just like, oh, well, it was fantasy techno babble because it was like, we're going to use this empathic ability and we're going to, you're going to use the thing that, but it, it was all things we'd seen before, you know, even though yeah. it was a little like we didn't realize that was what they were doing was possible. It was yeah, you know, no. still there. Oh, I was sitting before they ever even said anything. I was like, well, I mean, they should be able to use their powers together and have discovery amplify the message. <laughs> was oh really? Totally yeah, in my head. What, what, what episode they was that, that they're talking like, oh, about? Okay. Where they've done that before? Was that the? Oh, I don't know. Because they were they were mentioning like on this planet what we did, and I was like, I don't. Re- was was it the one? I don't remember. <laughs> yeah, I think I think if I'm not mistaken, it was the one uh, where uh, they they go to the planet and they're trying to end the Klingon war. Do you remember what I'm talking about? Oh gosh, yeah, and it's, yeah, it's more yeah, yeah, Saru yeah, yeah, yeah. goes goes nuts and runs right. through the forest and everything. I think that yes. I think that's where they that was the tech that they were trying to use again. Okay, but I don't okay. remember the particulars of that episode well enough to. Yeah, get exact. I haven't watched Discovery fifteen times like I have every ever other episode of Star Trek. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. All right, well, what else um, we got? Oh uh, well, uh, one more thing from Luke. Oh, he, yeah. he does mention without any tears. Um. And that's a, that's a common thing I see from from people who don't like the show is that they say that there's a lot of a lot more crying and whispering in <laughs> 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 Discovery than any other Star Trek show. Now, there's probably more crying, but you know, unless Counselor Troy is being controlled by somebody, or you know, I don't know. I seem to remember Kira gets pretty fiery at times. Kira gets pretty fiery at times. Uh, Tasha Yar is, you know, that's the funny thing is Roddenberry's track, the stuff that he was per, like in particular in, in charge of, you know, for someone who didn't want a lot of conflict between the crew, supposedly his Star Trek is more like I, we're going to cry and be hysterical over something or be like really emotional about something. Once Roddenberry died, like all of a sudden, like they were so trying to keep in line with what Roddenberry wanted or what they felt like he wanted based on his edicts that like a lot of crew members became more and more like cardboard. Right. Like they just didn't have a lot of emotion. That's what I was going to say. I totally hear you, Luke. If this is not for you, like you don't like that emotional thing, but like, this is what I wanted from, this is the thing. I love Star Trek. I love a lot of things about Star Trek, but this is the Mm. thing that I always was saying is missing is the humans being more human. Um, And I, you know, as much as my, my favorite characters in Star Trek are the ones that like, do allow themselves emotion like and we're dealing with a lot of characters here who are in very extreme situations and so yeah they're not uh you know kind of Jordy LaForge doing his duty or whatever you know like on the on the or like any character that just kind of sits and does their sort of does their thing and then occasionally has a emotional thing happen to them they're like right they're all dealing with the extremes of like a thousand years in the future Burnham has been outside the federation for a year or so like it, it's it's all these are these are extreme situations but also i don't mind if the characters get emotional i just just i always wanted the characters to be more emotional 
Yeah. And, you know, it's one of the things that I really liked about the original series is in the early episodes, you have Kirk saying stuff like, you know, other crew members can can afford to be emotional and show emotion. But me, I have to I can't show weakness. I'm the captain. I can't. Right. You know, I can't be with someone. I can't show that I love someone. I can't do all this stuff. And I don't think that was like naked time specifically. And then, you know, he gets the virus and he's, you know, no, no hand to hold. No, you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> and you have everyone sort of going through their own like emotional trials and how their careers and the expectations of their crewmates and, and what they're expected to do has like hindered them personally and emotionally. Um, I love that kind of stuff, but I, you know, I also like that, you know, pretty much the lower, then they stay true to that. A lot of the time on, on the original series is like a lot of the lower classmen can be, uh, more emotional and more, uh, reckless emotionally. And, uh, as we've stated, as has been pointed out, Burnham is not a captain. Yeah, for sure. Burnham is allowed to whisper and cry. Yeah. And you see, Saru, you don't really see Saru doing that much. And you don't. I, I also just don't mind. One thing I love, I like to see is having those yeah. emotional moments and then them overcoming those emotional moments, which I think right. is just more realistic. These are people not very far removed from us. And if you're in the middle of a space mm-hmm. battle, if you have a moment, well, like, like Detmer has been ha- having these sort of like flashes yeah. of, like fear and post-traumatic stress or whatever. Like she's, yeah. she's ha- she seems to be really having a problem, but then she, mm-hmm. she, she conquers it and then she does her job. And it's, it's, it's interesting. And that, that to me, that's drama. That's putting these emotional roadblocks blocks in their way, which yeah. I, I don't mind. I guess I just don't mind. I, but I hear you, Luke, if that's not for you, I totally hear you all respect to your opinion. I just, I like this. And what was funny though, is like, I read Luke's, uh, comment and then the very next thing that i saw was star trek had posted like the star trek account had posted video of that great scene from far beyond the stars where like benny russell is like crying going it's real right in my mind i was just like what what are people saying that star trek doesn't have any crying <laughs> <laughs> i rewatched that scene recently and I, you know, it's been a long, long time. I love DS9. I will always love DS9. Uh, yeah. That scene is so melodramatic, like just so far. Yeah. And I, I didn't watch all the setup. So, like, I think with the setup, it probably makes a little more sense. It does. Like, dude, they put Benny through the ringer. I realized that. I realized that. And I was trying to show it to Alyssa just like to show her like, hey, check out this, uh, you know, cool five minutes of, of screen time. And <laughs> I put it on and she's like, yeah. Uh, this, I think without the setup, it just looked really crazy. He looks like he's way overacting. Yeah. Which part of that is Avery Brooks overacting. Yeah. That's what I mean. And then, and then part of that is also like, no, he was crazy. Like the next time we see Benny, he's in a mental institution. Like, right. That, that episode spans like months of Benny's life and he is put he's through fought. the ring. Yeah. He's like, going, going nuts. He's like with a cane. He didn't start that episode with a cane. Man. He has been abused because of his race. Mm-hmm. And he is he has really been taken apart. So absolutely uh suggest that to anyone. Uh but I, I like Avery Brooks and I I like that he goes overboard with, oh, with I his too. acting. I can really respect it for what it is at the time, but we're in a different era and th- I think the acting that goes on in Discovery is um it's very emotional, but also I think very real. Yeah, I agree. And you know, they don't, they're not like, they don't have like the hysterical women on the show. <laughs> like they did in the original series or like, right. Which you basically had like hysterical women who weren't hysterical for any reason other than they were women. Yeah. <laughs> yeah and sure. they were frightened. Oh and, man. I forget what I watched. I watched an episode for, uh, I was on, <laughs> Oh gosh. I was on another. I was on another Star Trek podcast as a guest, and and the mm-hmm. the uh, uh, Trek geeks. I think it's Trek geeks. Um, okay, and they were. Uh, yeah, we we cover we covered a certain episode. It was basically like a woman being transported down to the ship, and it's the. Uh, I'm trying to remember. Oh, it's the one where uh, you meet Zephyr Cochran. That's that's right. Ah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 That woman was um, Eleanor Donahue. Wait, I'm not, am I wrong? 
I might be wrong. I don't know. Was she sick? She was like a diplomat yeah, and she was that's sick. It. That's it. Yeah. And then like they, they met the, the companion and Zeph from Cochran had been like restored and renewed and he was yeah. very young and yeah. 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 That yeah. was Eleanor Donahue. She played Ellie on the, the Andy Griffith show and went on to many, many other things over the course of her very long career. That character, but, um, uh, that character was just like, they were basically just talking about how, like, oh, she's just a hysterical woman, like, throughout the entire thing. <laughs> I was did, like, yeah. oh, man, this is so bad. Yeah, it can be. Yeah. Any other feedback before we yes, shuffle yes. off? Um, we've got uh, Stu Little says that Spock recording pales in comparison. Talking about from last week, <laughs> the hollow recording pales in comparison to what happened in the TNG season one episode. We'll always have Paris where Picard just gives the holodeck a place in time and is able to show him how his old girlfriend reacted when he didn't show up for a date 22 years earlier. <laughs> Which, you know what? That would have been a look. That is wonderful. Thank you for remembering yes, that. Uh, that's fantastic. Uh, but I will say this. That was a public a public place in Paris at a very at a very obvious public location okay it's like eiffel tower and shit it's like would, eiffel I would, tower I would, and shit <laughs> i think it was the eiffel tower but look i would expect any street corner in modern day to have security footage in a public place like that right so i would absolutely expect them to have you know hollow recorders in places like that now that and that's something they should actually touch on. they should have touched on more in star trek because i love the idea that you know, people in the future have to overcome this this need to go back and look at certain events the way they they may have hurt someone. Um, to actually go back and look at something that they were not a part of, but something that they caused. I I love that that notion, and I love that Picard finally did and went back and looked at it and dealt with what he did. Um, and I think Star Trek maybe should have gone into that a little more over the years instead of just being like, whoop, we're caught in another wacky holodeck adventure, mm. another ma- holodeck malfunction. Like, there's so much that they could have done with the holodeck that they just haven't done because, right. you know, well, we'll always have Paris was cheesy. They would never have. Uh, he shouldn't be able to bring that up. Well, of course he should. Of course, like that was a very public area. Of course, yeah, they would have. Had, you I know, mean, it's 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 just debatable. What bothers me is like when they go back and they look at like security footage, or they're having a trial, and they go back and look at the footage, and it's like edited together perfectly, like a movie. Yeah, right. <laughs> because <laughs> it is me. a movie. It is literally mm-hmm. the movie that. Uh, but you could you could look at that as just like we're always watching. Uh, we're always watching these hollow novels. These are all just hollow yeah. novels we're watching. And I thought about that a few months ago. Uh, I read an article about how uh, there are there is AI now that's learning how to like basically make movies. And wow. I was just thinking like, oh shit, could you just have like an auto feature? Like, and dude, I, we've got you could download an app that will just take your footage and make like out of a template, make an, uh, make a movie that looks good. Now, it might not be the content you necessarily want out of that video but that, that, that you shot, but we've already got something resembling it. Right. So, you know, you could headcanon any kind of bullshit. For sure. Um, For sure. Okay. Uh, what, else, <laughs> anyway, what else we got on there on the feedback? Little, little Trank says, thanks for replying to my feedback last week. Sorry I boned all of the facts about the spot clip and unification. Dude, you didn't bone anything. Everybody thought that. Everybody went back and looked at that and said, how do they have that that holiday? I did, too, for a second. And then I like, looked back, and I'm still like perplexed. I don't know what the hell happened. I'm, I, I just have to surmise it was alternate takes or something. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you guys are all having that uh, Mend- Mandela effect. Well, no, you just, you, you recognize some of the footage and some of the words and, you know, you kind of go like, what did we do? And it, you, it is very much a situation where you have to say, what is the headcanon I can create for myself here? Because, <laughs> you know, eh. he says, I realize the Federation is USA, but since DS9, uh, but since DS9, the Federation is showing more and more villainy. 
And I'd just like them to do more of the right things again. I, you know, I would honestly probably argue that next generation in the original series had a lot of Federation villainy, you know, shitty admirals, shitty colonels sure. and, and commodores and all sorts of people um, who wanted them to do the wrong thing because of reasons. I have to get to blah, blah, blah. Right. You can't do this thing. You can't take your first officer to Vulcan so he won't die. <laughs> sure. I have a lunch date. Um. <laughs> yeah, there's always been a little bit of that pushback of the power of the Federation and you yeah. know, bureaucracy or whatever. There's always been like a slight, I feel like there's always been like a slight notion that not everything was quite up to snuff. Yeah, for sure. But um, especially when it was like, well, Kirk's not going to like this answer. What do you mean we're not going to fix the Enterprise? <laughs> Time to mutiny. <laughs> <laughs> uh, little Trank also says, also, please talk about the ready room sneak peek of the next Discovery episode. Try not to spoil in case you hadn't seen it. Was that canon already? Um, okay, so what he's talking about. Uh, yeah, spoiler <laughs> alert if you don't want to know about next week, but we're going to discuss the uh, uh, yeah. next week's ep- on, on next week's episode. Right. Now, if you don't want to hear, thank you for listening. All the things that the star, star Trek, you cast.com. Oh yeah. Hey, love you. Love you. Love you. Okay. So ready room produce like there, they didn't produce it. They, uh, put out a, a sneak peek scene that talk that where we have, uh, David Cronenberg back talking to Culber and they're looking at a hologram of Giorgio. And Cronenberg is explaining that in the temporal cold war or in the temporal wars, they discovered that when using time as a weapon, uh, you could, or it, 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 they found out that it does horrible things to the body. Your, your cells were meant to operate in the time they were created in. And then, they had never seen it before what is happening to Giorgio except for once with a, uh, and they bring up the hologram of, um, of, of an alien. We've seen the alien before in a previous episode of discovery this year, actually, but it's a character we've never heard of before a, a time soldier named your, and he's in a 24th, uh, century Starfleet uniform, uh, you know, TNG season one, two, uh, Kind of uh, uniform, and uh, he uh, he says he is from uh, twenty three seventy nine. He was a time soldier from twenty three seventy nine, but he came from an alternate reality that was created during a time incursion from a Romulan mining vessel. Mm-hmm. Narada, anyone? The Kelvin verse? Yep, I think that's what it is. Mm-hmm. Pretty sure that's what it is. And what interests me about this is um, the, the that seems like it's almost the, the way they're talking about that is as if that's part of the time wars, you know? Yeah. Like it's, it's clearly not exactly, but like, I don't know. He's part of the time wars and, and, and that time they call it a time incursion, which it clearly is. But like, yeah. I, I don't know. It just interests me to f- think about like, how did that Spin off universe relate to the time wars because it seems like he is a time soldier from that mm-hmm. time in that universe, which means our universe yeah. at some point was engaged in a war either with or against that universe. Yep. Yeah. What? <laughs> Somehow the Kelvin verse is tied up with the temporal wars, which would make sense. Yeah. It, it, well, um, if 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 somehow you know we, we've talked we've talked about the different theories of time travel. If somehow there's like a, a limited number of let's say universes that can exist or something, and we get to a place where like that resources is being depleted and like universes have to fight, kind of thing. Like that's mm-hmm. that is interesting stuff. And like I've seen it in other other sorts of uh, you know media. And so, right. like, yeah, what is it? What does it mean? What does it mean? Uh, 
I mean, we know there are versions of the Defiant that have gone back in time and shown up in Enterprise Era Mirrorverse. We know, you know, certain things about how, you know, something can go back in time and be in a different reality. But we've never seen what it does to an actual person on a molecular level, which is what they're doing with Giorgio, because her body is not only trying to get back in time, her body is trying to get back in time, but to her universe. Um, as, as Cronenberg's character explains. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, your was a time soldier who died in the, sem- in, in a very similar way. They'd never seen it uh, except for with your, and I just, are we going to find out why he was in the Kelvin timeline or like why he crossed over from the Kelvin timeline into, uh, our timeline in the first place? Like, I, all this is very interesting to me. I doubt it. I kind of doubt we'll ever find out about that particular guy, but like, well, yeah, no, I mean, just like, the is there going to be that the idea that these uh, characters have well, like, like these characters have reconnected somehow, like these universes have definitely at some point now right. have reconnected and that leads to all kinds of ideas of possible, uh, you know, right. Uh, crossovers between like the Kelvin timeline and our current timeline. And what could that mean? You know, I love it. Yeah. I'm not necessarily concerned about your specifically though. I do. <laughs> I do like the name. The name is fun for yeah. what he, for what he is. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the time soldier of your, yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I, 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 I'm primarily interested in, a crossover with Kelvin verse or what that might mean for, you know, uh, the original series era or what it might mean for, you know, what the prime timeline is currently now. Um, I'm just interested in all that kind of stuff and they could do whatever they wanted because of science fiction. Um, and they could make us all happy. Well, not, they won't make us all happy, but they can make me happy. <laughs> <laughs> by, for uh, with any number of ways of of going into this thing, but also I just love I love alternate universes. I love time travel, I, and and you throw both of those together, and it's all in Star Trek, and uh, you have a happy camper. So, um, yeah, I, I look at me uh, talking about my sexuality. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I th- you've, you've grown, man. You've grown. <laughs> yeah, I think I think alternate universe and time travel storylines are, <laughs> are my sexuality. <laughs> <laughs> I weirdly identify with that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, now that we've made you all participate in this weird sexual ritual of us talking about Star Trek, yeah. Um, <laughs> any other uh, any other any other feedbacks? I think that the last one. Uh, that's it, man. That's it. That's all, all right. I got. Well, I uh, had had a good time chatting with you this evening. It was a much longer episode than normal. I Yeah, I thought it was going to be way shorter than this. Yeah, I didn't realize we were going to talk about the large scope of everything Star Trek and then get into gender identity and then dive into the movies and then get- <laughs> I didn't know we were doing that either man and then actually have like a good 40 minute conversation about the episode then go into feedback <laughs> yeah I came in thinking this was a pretty straightforward episode we're not going to talk much you know I came into this conversation like an innocent babe into the world yeah. And, uh, and and eight, two sorry. hours later, I'm jaded. I'm corrupted. I'm sorry, I corrupted you. <laughs> sorry, um, I feel like this is I feel like I'm getting a lot of blame here. No, no, it's fine. It's, it wasn't you. It was uh, the, the back catalog of knowledge that we've accrued over these, you know, low these many years uh, <laughs> for Star Trek and and our, and our our love for these properties. Yeah. Well. I hope you all share that love and it is wonderful to get together here and share it with you. Uh, we'll be back very soon. Uh, please uh, hit us up with any feedback for next week. Uh, we, we're, we're trying to really get to these episodes as quick as we can, either like late uh, Thursday or Friday, something like that, when we can should be able to do something similar yeah. next week. So if you can hit us up with your feedback, you know, after you see the episode, we might be able to get to the show. So um, thank yeah, you. Don't guys. wait. Just, just yeah. send Star Trek you cast on Twitter and yeah. just 
go for it, man. I believe if you go to strandedpanda.com uh, and, and click on the St- Star Trek UCast, I also have all the all the links and stuff there, too. And you said Star Trek UCast.com takes us somewhere there, too? I mean, that's the website. That's our website. Cool. I like it. But, uh, but yeah, Star Trek UCast on Twitter is a great place to, to connect with me because that's Twitter's my primary social media at this point. Yeah. Let's just be real. Yeah, man. <laughs> I hate Facebook. Every time I go there, it's just like angry rednecks who don't want black ladies on Star Trek. And I just don't get it. And I get angry and move on. Yeah. <laughs> I hear you. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Well, we will be back. Uh, peace. Jolan True. And all the rest. Here on Star Trek Isle. Thank you for listening to the Star Trek Universe Podcast, a Stranded Panda production. If you'd like to hear more from David C. Robertson, check out the DC On Screen Podcast or maladjusted.tv for his web videos. If you'd like to hear more from Matthew Carroll, check out the Marvel Cinematic Universe Podcast or listen to his music. Just search for Matthew Carroll anywhere you get music. 